The day started early this morning. We had 80 high school students who visited us our, our labs to learn about sciences and engineering at Hofstra, and it was a great experience to talk with them and show them about technical things we do. But in general, the purpose of the day is to celebrate achievements of women in STEM fields. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce our provost, Dr. Gail Simmons, a fellow biologist, to come up and say a few words about the day, and then the speaker will be introduced and we will go on with the program. Dr. Simmons. Good afternoon. Um, I am thrilled to be able to be here to uh, introduce today's speaker on Ada Lovelace Day. Uh, as a woman in science myself, I know how valuable it is to know that in history there are role models, that there are people who have achieved who look like you when you want to move forward in these things. And Ada Lovelace is an example of how the very foundations of what we now call computer science were not gender specific, but in fact were the result of an amazing collaboration between Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage. And so Ada Lovelace is someone that young women today can look at as not just a participant in computer science, not just someone who moved the field forward incrementally, but who was a founder of the field. And I was fascinated by the fact that Charles Babbage referred to her as an enchantress of numbers. That he, he saw her abilities in this area as almost magical and somehow transformative. You know, that she had a power over these things that went beyond the sort of diligence and hard work. It was, it was a matter of inspiration, something a bit magical. The thing about Ada Lovelace Day that also resonates with me, um, I am, as, as Dean Rabani told you, a biologist. But my role model in becoming a scientist um, was another computer scientist and another woman who broke a lot of ground. Um, I had the immense privilege at the age of 11 to be introduced and have dinner with, at that time, Commander Grace Hopper of uh, the United States Navy, who is widely credited as the person to invent the first compiler and who was involved in the invention, formulation, standardization and promulgation of COBOL as an early programming language for database use. Um, I had the opportunity to meet her because she was a colleague of my father's. They worked together on something called the Conference on Data Systems Languages. And he had the assignment to pick her up at the airport for a meeting one day, and he took my mother and me along. And she was the first woman I ever met who was not a nurse, a school teacher, or a bank teller, or a housewife. So to me, that was a transformative moment. So I think that the kind of thing that Ada Lovelace Day celebrates is that it's really critical to have someone you can look at who represents in your mind someone that you might strive to be like. And you may not end up doing what that person did. I certainly did not end up as a computer scientist. In fact, my father's attempts to teach me to program in COBOL probably scotched that for the foreseeable future. But she showed me, just being able to sit at a table and have dinner with her, showed me that there was something that I could do that was beyond anything that anyone in my family had ever done. So I think it's wonderful that we have a young alum today to come back and be a bit of a role model for students at Hofstra to demonstrate that there are role models out there for women in computer science. And we hope that events like this will reverse the rather unfortunate trend that there are fewer women in, in majoring in computer science now than there were 20 years ago. But before I turn it over to our faculty member who will introduce our uh, speaker, I just want to say that I, just before coming down here, I found a really encouraging statistic in that regard. So we all know that across the country, uh, women make up a 
minority of students studying computer science, and it's usually not in the list of top majors that women pursue. But I discovered that this fall, at Stanford University, computer science is the most popular major for young female undergraduates at Stanford. It edged out human biology, which has been the number one major for women for a number of years. They have 214 women majoring in computer science, and it's about 30% of all their majors. And for heaven's sake, if Stanford can do it, so can Hofstra. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our faculty member, who is going to introduce our speaker for today. And again, thank you all for being here. I would like to, pay, uh, to thank uh, the Provost for this inspiring speech. And uh, I would like to welcome back Dani to Hofstra. And it's really, she's an amazing person. I remember her, it was one of the first years that I started teaching. She was, come here next to me. She was very uh, cheering, petite, hanging a lot of time in the lounge. All the rest of the group that was hanging in the lounge, lounge were boys. And because they were spending a lot of time there, I assumed they were also working, not just having fun. Um, then during, so Danny majored in BS in computer science and minor in business information systems, and somehow which gave her really an edge. She had the depth in knowledge in computing and breadth of the various areas, and at the same time, the business acumen that basically she got from the, her business education. So while at Hofstra, we just were talking, she started Danny Web as a hobby, and it came out of need for somehow creating a system, a network for tutoring apparently. <laughs> and while she was at Hofstra and when she graduated, she pursued her dream and started Danny Webb. What is interesting though, she just reminded me that we were speaking about and due to some family uh, changing family situation, she actually, when she was undergraduate, she had to start running the family business at the same time taking classes and uh, I thought that this was really a great responsibility, but also a challenge and rewarding thing to do. But during our conversation, she actually explained that yeah, she has this project and she wants to develop it into business, her own business, and then my eyes opened and I thought, wow, this is really awesome. Running a family business is one thing, but having your own? And I am very, very glad that she didn't drop the ball. When she graduated, she started her own business, and I'm going to read from what I was, details about her business. Danny Webb has developed into a thriving online community of over one million IT professionals with 10 million visitors a month, making it not only one of the largest social media websites in this niche, but also one of the largest publications on the web to date. She thought she participates in conferences and meetings. She talks about especially big, big data uh, and security. She um, holds bi-monthly meeting groups on Long Island, Easter Queens. And she just started last year. She launched basically Danny Path, which is a brick and mortar co-working community. Uh, which is really extremely successful, for, especially for the tech people in Queens and Eastern Long Island. And they're so successful that they're expanding with 7,000 square feet. Um, and it's, she's really doing amazing things. Last year, she was honored with Hofstra Young Alumni Award, which I'm very sad I had to miss. I was on leave, but I'm very, very happy to Welcome, Danny, home. Hello, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to give a presentation on big data, SEO, and actionable results. So, so big data is all about dealing with enormous data sets, data sets comprised of millions and billions of records. And you're going to be dealing with these large data sets when you are dealing with search engines, 
<laughs> when you're dealing with search engines, um, when you're dealing with social networks, when you're dealing with anything that is involving millions and billions of records, um, and especially that's the case when you're doing data mining or data analysis where you're tracking um, users every movement and then using that information to um, to basically come up to some type of actionable results or to basically to be able to interpret um, the information that you've gathered. So um, when you're tr being tracked online, um, your mouse movements are being tracked, whether you look to the right or to the left um, with the mouse cursor is being tracked, um, what order you click on things. And because of all of this is being tracked, um, you're dealing with these enormous, enormous, enormous um, data sets because, for example, in Facebook, you're not just, um, you know, Facebook doesn't just keep track of, okay, you have 500 friends and here are your status updates. There's so much more that goes on behind the scenes um, that Facebook knows about you other than what they actually have on the website that, that you can see about yourself. Um, so. Um, then SEO is uh, search engine optimization. It's how to rank high in the search results, um, in the search result, in the search result pages, so that you can actually get traffic and actionable results. So basically, my presentation is all about how to take these enormous data sets, translate that into the information that you need to rank high in the search results and then use that information to come up with some type of actionable results um, in terms of a greater return on your investment as an online website. Um, so as Dr. Kambarova was saying, um, when I was a, a student here, I started a website called dannyweb.com. Um, I started it um, for computer science students to get help from other computer science students, um, kind of like a free uh, tech forum. And I started selling advertising space on the site, became very interested in search engine optimization. And um, basically, this is kind of an overview of everything that I've learned. So a brief history of me. <laughs> um, as Dr. Kambarova said, I started, I did a B BS in computer science with a minor in BCIS. And um, at the time, I went to go participate in the UTP, the University Tutorial Program. And when I went to UTP, um, I learned that every single department on campus had free one-on-one -on -one tutoring, except for the computer science department. We were the only department where I had to be a tutor being placed into one of the computer science labs and students would come to me who needed help, which they rarely did. Um, and then when I went on to become a sophomore, junior, and a senior, there was no one to help me. So out of that frustration came a need, and I created an online community for computer science students to get help from other computer science students, uh, basically a message forum. And this was back in 2002. So originally the site started just as me and my friends, um, you know, just posting to each other on the forum, talking about, you know, the classes we were taking and trying to get help from each other. And then one day someone I didn't know signed up on the site. And then a couple more people signed up on the site. And each time that someone signed up, I put so much thought and energy and effort into giving them an instant answer. If, I, if they came and they asked a question and I didn't know the answer, the, within 10 minutes of them posting, I researched the answer and I might spend a half hour researching the answer to some random person's question somewhere across the internet because I wanted to give them that feeling of instant gratification. Because um, especially when you're starting a forum online, and this was back in 2002, um, one of the things that I learned early on is that forum users are really, really, really greedy and they're really egocentric. And they don't care whether or not a forum has a million people on it or 10 people on it. All that they care about is that their individual questions get answered. So if you're going to participate in a message forum, people typically go towards the ones that are really, really active. And why do you go to the ones that are active? Because you think that there's a better chance of being you know, of, of getting an answer that you're looking for yourself. You don't really care about everyone else if anyone else gets their question answered, you just care about yourself. So if I was able to duplicate that behavior and be able to give someone exactly what they were looking for with only 10 other people on the site, then so be it, that 
individual person still got what they were looking for. They got their own instant gratification. They had a successful experience and they were going to come back. So that's kind of how I faked it till you make it type of thing. Um, so then as more and more people started to use the site, I became really, really, really interested in, wow, 10 people are using it. What could I do to get 50? What could I, now there's 50 people, what could I do to get 500? I was just so excited about how people around the world were using something that I created from scratch, that I wanted to put focus and energy into what could I do to get more people using it. Um, so because of that, I started really studying internet marketing and search engine optimization. Um, and along that, um, I also started focusing on user interface and user design. Um, I, want, I wanted, um, yeah, I focus on user interface and how a website's design influences how people use it. So putting a logo in the top left because people read from left to right, top to bottom. Maybe if you put the logo in the top right, people aren't going to notice your site as easily or, or have that brand recognition because people always expect the logo to be in the same spot. Or a call to action button, which is a button that um, basically is the, is where you want the person, the end user visitor to click on next, um, having that prominently focused. So there's so many different things that go into user interface that make people actually um, doing, um, basically it's the act of convincing people to do something that you want them to do without them realizing that you want them to do it or that they're actually um, following subliminal rules and, and uh, following your guidelines. So the effective uh, use of UI UX. So as I had just said, compel people's behavior without them realizing that it wasn't their decision. So it's all about convincing people to do something that they don't realize that they were meant to, that they, it, they don't realize that it wasn't their decision to do it. So if let's say you have step one, step two, step three, and step three is a big continue button in green, people are compelled to hit that green continue button and they think that it's their decision, but it's really just the design that can be used to compel people to do what you want them to do and to follow the actions that you want them to follow when navigating through a site. So then you can use call to action buttons to guide people's behavior towards the next steps. Um, like I said, step one, step two, step three. And that's um, if you think of an e-commerce site where you have an add to cart button or and you have a checkout button. Um, you know, or Amazon.com, you have the, um, a checkout button that, sh that for example, um, <laughs> you have um, an add to cart button. And it follows the progression where um, you don't realize that the add to cart button is actually more prominent on one page and then the checkout button is more prominent on another. And you're actually using the design to to um, encourage people to follow what you want them to follow. Um, again, with call to action buttons, you're gonna wanna use action words. Um, so I might say, check out here, or in, instead, of, instead of it being, um, you know, here's the register or a noun, it's gonna be like, check out now, click here, all different action words, and that's really what people respond to online. And then using color theory um, to influence, you know, using color theory to um, influence what people think of a website. Um, one of the tricks that I've always used um, is that when I'm creating a design, I'll create it and then I'll step back all the way to the other side of the room and I'll see if I can tell right away without being able to read the words because it's too far away, be able to tell what the website is about. And you'll notice that there's a lot of tech sites that are always blue and um, like we did in the morning um, session today, um, Halloween is, tends to be orange and black and red tends to be either a very fire emergency alert color um, green means go or check out. Um, so different colors have different subliminal um, clues that can be used, not only to direct the user where to go, but also to give the end user a specific type of feeling or um, emotion, and also to be able to 
give a sense of what the website is about without people actually having to read individual words. Um, so I think that um, you, you have, I think, maybe at most five to ten seconds from when a end user first opens a web page to actually get their attention and be able to tell, have them understand is this website for me? Is this something that's worth my time to even read? Or is this not something that I'm interested in? And therefore you can just use the design to basically convey that message. And a lot of times that needs to be conveyed just, is it sharp angles? Is it sharp lines? Is there a lot of, is it cartoony? Is it not cartoony? What kind of fonts are used? What kind of color schemes are used? And all that information goes into effective use of UI. So I'm not sure if any of you um, in the audience remember Facebook's experiment. Um, I think it was maybe like two years ago. But basically, Facebook manipulated users' emotions without their knowledge. Does anyone remember that? Um, yes. So what they did was um, they, um, when, when you are using Facebook, um, you get so you have so many Facebook friends nowadays. People have like 500 Facebook friends. Um, and there's no way for you to get so many different status updates from all of your friends every day. So Facebook's algorithm only gives you the most important or what they deem the most important or most relevant Facebook status updates are. And um, a couple of years ago, they ran an experiment where they wanted to see if Facebook status updates affected end users' emotions. So if you were a part of the experiment, then what they did is for a certain uh, population of people, all the status messages um, were always negative. Um, so they used AI to be able to tell whether individual status messages were positive, neutral, or negative. It's, you know, look, I just celebrated my wedding, or my cat died, or whether it was a positive or negative you know, um, connotation. And so imagine getting every single Facebook status message that you received was either entirely positive, entirely negative, entirely neutral, or you were part of the experiment. And what they were able to conclude is that people that, re that were seeing only positive status updates from their friends tended to post, tended to post only positive status updates themselves, while people that were getting only negative status updates were responding with only negative things to say. So if they kept seeing this person's cat died, and this person lost their job, and this person had this happen to them, and this person had that happen to them, that, you know, it would really bring them down, and then they would just say, oh, this day sucks for me too. But, you know, on the other hand, if someone was getting all, seeing all positive status updates, they tended to do the same. So that's just an example of how a social network like Facebook can use big data to, first of all, um, take all these billions of status updates that they're getting, actually use artificial intelligence to determine if the words in this Facebook message are positive, negative, or neutral, and then use that, um, that data that they collected to show these status messages to end users and affect end users' emotions. So that's just an example of how big data can be used to actually, you know, not just do all this data analysis behind the scenes, but how it can translate into directly affecting end users' emotions. And this actually, um, this actually went on to be a uh, big PR nightmare for Facebook. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so uh, like I said, big data um, is used to help guide UI UX. You uh, collect data on how people use your website, and then you can take that information and apply it the way that Facebook did, or maybe not in such a negative way as Facebook did. Um, you can use heat maps that track, um, there are heat maps that can be used in research studies that you put on goggles and you sit a bunch of people um, in front of a computer using a different websites and you track their eye movements to see how they're actually interacting with a website, what they see first versus what they click on. Um, there's also heat maps that tell where the mouse is moving and what's clicked on first. And that's all information that can be used where if someone is taking the mouse, and people tend to f use the mouse to follow what they're reading as they're reading a website, and you might hover that mouse right, left, right, left, right, left, then not click on anything and just bounce back. And that might, you know, you could use that information to say, okay, 
you can use that data to say, okay, this is a bad user experience. People are, you know, hunting and searching for information and then not clicking on any on what they were looking for. Maybe that's a bad user experience. Or I can be taking the mouse and looking and looking and looking and eventually click. Or I can load the website and there's a big button that says click here now and people click there immediately. So you can use heat maps um, to track visitor behavior and you can um, you know, just track the where the cursor goes and you can track where people are clicking and you can track things like time on site and time on a specific page. So if let's say it, the page is an article, people are going to want to be reading a long article and you would expect those people to spend maybe like five, ten minutes reading the page if they're reading an article. But if the page is just a navigational one, then if they're spending more than a minute you know, on this navigational page, then there's a problem with your navigation because why are they not finding what they're looking for so quickly? Um, so you can use all this information to track a visitor's behavior and then link it back to, well, what could I do to make my navigation more efficient? Because if you get to a navigational page and 50% of the people who visit the page are not clicking through to uh, where they ultimately want to end up, well, you just lost 50% of your visitors, and now 50% of your visitors are not, first of all, you're losing that page view, and if you're selling advertising space per page, then that doesn't work out for you. And the second reason is because now, um, you know, they're leaving unsatisfied. They didn't get the answer that they were looking for. So you can use all this information, such as time on site, and time on page, and how many pages per visit, um, and especially um, what the entrance pages are versus the exit pages on a page um, to determine whether your navigation system is correct. And you can also use things such as bounce rate. And bounce is when someone comes in, visits a page, and then immediately bounces back out of the site without clicking on a second page. Um, so that's also either a positive or a negative statistic. Um, for example, I, on Danny Web, the forum, we have a lot of traffic that's coming in from Google search results, and they're coming in from Google. They're, um, they're coming into a specific article. They're spending a long time reading a specific article, and then they're bouncing back to the Google search results. So then, you know, it's very possible that it was a successful, you know, visit for them. They got the answer that they were looking for, and now they're just done. While, like I said before, if it's a home page or a navigational page, then you want to, them to follow through, especially, you know, with an e-commerce site, you want to see what the abandonment rate is, which is the percentage of people that actually don't follow through um, from adding things to a cart to actually checking out. So, um, yeah, you can convert, uh, the idea is, what can I do to analyze these data sets to find correlations? And you find the correlations between time on site and, you know, whether or not they're actually purchasing what you, what you want them to. Um, if they're, if it's an e-commerce site, are they spending a half hour on your site and then not, not purchasing something? Maybe that means that either your price point is wrong or they just can't find what they're looking for. So then you go a step further and, and um, see if, um, you know, you can take that a step further. And there's just so, so, so much that you can do to track well is the problem that they can't. Uh, find what they're looking for, is the problem the price, or is the problem that they're not in need of the service right now. So there's just so much that you can um, try and test, try and test, try and test. And at the end of the day, um, the goal is to create a higher return on investment. So um, the next uh, couple of slides um, broke, is broke, are broken up into three parts. So step one means test different theories. Um, and that means do a lot of A-B testing. Test one thing, change that one thing, test again. Change one different thing, test again. Because there's an unlimited number of factors that can influence what makes someone purchase or not purchase, stay on a site versus not stay on a site. As I was saying before, it could be just due to it could be just due to um, it could be uh, <laughs> sorry <laughs> um, 
as I was saying before, um, you know, you really don't know what the cause, um, what the cause and effect are. So you want to just test one thing and change it, test one thing and change it. So um, something that I've learned a long time ago that I always, always, always um, remind myself and remind others, and I'm always reminding others that you should never listen to what people say, always listen to what they do. I can tell you how many people I've encountered who have said, oh, I'm not really into social media. But meanwhile, they're spending 10 hours a day on Facebook. Um, you know, or um, you might find people who think, um, you know, who think that one thing is true and it ends up being something completely different. So um, one of my fam favorite quotes is Henry Ford, um, where he says, if I had asked people what they wanted, then they would have just said faster horses. Um, and that's because you need to go to people and ask them, okay, well, what do you want? Um, because they might think that they have the solution, but they really don't. So for example, um, on Danny Web, my, my website, if I am changing a navigation structure um, or I'm changing the way the navigation works, or then I might get 500 people coming to me and saying, it shouldn't work this way, it should work that way, or it shouldn't work this way, it should work that way. And I always have everybody is um, contradicting what everybody else says. And so who do you listen to? So my answer is I don't listen to anyone. I just track their behavior and listen to the results because they might say, oh, I hate the new navigation system now. But then if you actually look at the analytics, they're using the site twice as much. So you really just can't necessarily listen to user behavior because what they perceive isn't necessarily what the results are. Um, so in some ways with UI UX, it's all about perception and with other things, it's all about the actual numbers. Um, and especially with this Henry Ford quote, um, I'm always, always, always going back to that. Um, you know, because it really, um, for me, ta really takes the innovator to basically conceive something that no one else had thought of. So while, you know, what Henry Ford did is okay, what do you want? Well, we want faster horses. So in their mind, all they can conceptualize of is a horse. They ride on horses. Now they want to go faster. So in their head, okay, I want to go faster. I want faster horses. So now it takes an innovator to say, okay, you're saying that you want faster horses, but at the end of the day, all you really want is to go faster. What can I do to come up with a more efficient, better way for you to go faster? Um, hence the automobile. So then I have these uh, little cartoons here. Um, and can my boyfriend come along? I'm not your boyfriend. You totally are. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, so um, here, if you look at the tour of accounting, we have a random number generator, and the generator is just spitting out 9999999. He says, and Dilbert says, are you sure that's random? And he says, that's the problem with randomness. You can never be sure. So at the end of the day, um, it's just, again, me trying to show you guys that don't listen to what people say. Listen to what they do. <laughs> and, um, you, you know, you, you never, uh, when you're doing all this A-B testing, again, you don't necessarily know if the problem, if the data actually is random. And that's kind of, is random or if the data is as a result of what you've changed. So when you're doing A-B testing, like I said before, a billion different factors can come into play. So you might change the logo um, from the left to the right, and you might think, okay, well, all I did was change the logo, but now by moving the logo a few pixels to the right on the screen, people might notice the right-hand side more than they notice the left-hand side, and now the checkout button on your e-commerce site stands out more. Now more people are making a purchase when what you were doing is really just trying to test whether or not more people were going to go to the home page or testing a different logo. So you might be thinking that you're testing brand recognition by changing the design of the logo, but the design of the logo might influence five million other factors. So um, always test, 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 and um, yeah. <laughs> so step two is now that you did all that testing, analyze the results. <laughs> um, and this is again bringing back how, um, you know, I started with a computer science degree here at Hofstra, and 
I then went on to start this website. My entire life I wanted to just be a computer programmer. I've been programming my entire life. It was a no-brainer that I was going to do a computer science degree. I come to Hofstra and I graduate with a computer science degree and find myself selling advertising space for the past 15 years. <laughs> so, um, you know, so now it's me coming back here and I just want to show you guys that you can actually be, um, a, you know, basically relating advertising and marketing and sales all back to your computer science degree and all back to that math and statistics courses that you were taking. Um, so here, um, step two, analyze the results and you kind of have that one little, uh, that one little outlier that uh, is trying to disprove your whole theory and you're like, no, just erase that one. <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, um, you can't necessarily do that because you don't really know, is this just an outlier or is, is it really disproving your theory? Um, and it just goes back to testing everything and um, just factoring everything in. And step three, extrapolate your results. Um, so in my little cartoon here, yesterday she had, uh, you know, she got married. Yesterday she had zero husbands. Today she has one husband. So by the end of the month, she'll have 30 husbands, <laughs> uh, you know, following that same uh, guideline. So um, the next step is to extrapolate. Um, in the case of Danny Webb, um, we get 10 million page views a month. And therefore, uh, um, even Google Analytics doesn't give us the option of tracking that much data. Again, you're dealing with big data. So maybe taking 10% and then extrapolating it to the rest, but you have to make sure that it's the correct 10%. Um, you know, because absolutely, like I was, like I just, my uh, broken record here for my presentation is that every single thing, um, you know, influences. So if I'm extrapolating, I need to make sure it's the exact same demographic and it's the exact same people with the same frame of mind and it's the exact same, you know, everything. For example, um, something that actually just happened this morning is I, uh, before I came here today, is I have an ad campaign running on Danny Webb and they wanted to target people um, who are hardware, um, hardware IT people. And so they purchased an ad campaign on Danny Webb that is in our forum threads. And they want to know why it didn't perform as well as the campaign that they ran last year, also targeting the exact same audience on the exact same website. And they said, well, is the problem that our ad looks different this time? Um, you know, before our ad uh, was, was rectangular and now our ad is square. That has to be the problem. And what I had answered them before I came here today was that, no, actually what it is, is even though you're still targeting uh, the exact same hardware IT people on the exact same website before you were advertising on our navigational pages and today you're advertising on our forum threads. So our forum threads have people that are coming in from a Google search, they're doing a Google search for a particular question and answer, they're clicking in from the Google search and they're getting the answer that they were looking for saying, okay, um, you know, I'm reading my answer, I'm getting the answer, I'm in the middle of a problem, I'm trying to solve this problem. You know, how many people have, uh, you know, done Google searches and ended up at Stack Overflow or some type of forum, said, okay, you got the answer, then you just bounce back to the Google search results. You're not necessarily in the frame of mind to say, you know what, while I'm on this page, let me stop and start purchasing a product. But meanwhile, on the navigational pages that they used to advertise on, uh, people would come in and I was, you know, th those were people who were in a different headspace. They weren't, they were the exact same demographic, but they weren't currently in the need of solving, of a problem that they were halfway through. So they would come to the nav, they would come in and they'd say, okay, I'm interested in hardware IT. What can you offer me? And so even though we're talking about the exact same demographic, you have to talk about the same headspace. Um, you know, are they, what is, are they on a mission or are they not on a mission? Um, and all of these factors completely change the way the visitor's behavior and the way people use the site. So when you're extrapolating, you know, you need to take all this into consideration. And then A, B, test, 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 rinse and repeat. Um, so as it says, both internal and external factors always have an influence, constantly collect data, constantly test, constantly react. So I'm going to, um, you know, like I, like I 
been saying, you're going to want to, uh, you know, take so many factors into consideration. It could be, um, you know, the same audience in a different headspace. It could be a different audience. It could be males versus females react to things differently. It could be that you, you know, someone posted something, um, some type of user-generated content that left a bad taste in people's mouths or a bad impression, and now people are using the site in an entirely different way because it's something you didn't even realize. So there's just so many factors that influence. Um, audience demographics. So you're going to want to segment audiences. As I've said, there's male, there's female, there's people that are on a mission, there's people that are looking to purchase something, there's people coming in from search engines that are going to be different than people who are coming in from social media sites. You know, you can have the exact same person who um, might be in need of buying something new or buying a particular red widget that you have for sale, but at 10 in the morning they're ready to buy the widget and at 3 p.m. they are not ready to buy the widget or vice versa. So it's all about getting the, the correct person at the correct time and presenting them with the correct information. Um, having targeted advertising, having a targeted messaging, um, Give people exactly what they want by analyzing individual behavior and usage patterns. So by being able, um, in my example before, tracking a user's navigational patterns, if you're finding that they come to your navigational page and they're not uh, necessarily clicking through or they come to your, your e-commerce site and you were able to determine that they came in from a Google search for wanting to buy or cheap whatever, and then they get through and you're not necessarily, and they're not making the purchase, well why aren't they making the purchase? Is it, did they type cheap widgets and your widget isn't cheap enough? Or if you really think that you have a competitive price, then what else is, is wrong with your navigation or with your website in, they wanted a cheap widget, you're offering a cheap widget, they're obviously in the market to buy a cheap widget right now. So what can you do to, um, you know, to improve, um, you know, that was a better call to action or something that actually is going to convince them to make the sale. So create a customized user experience without the end users realizing it. And that's all about collecting this demographic information about the end user and then actually using it um, without them realizing you're using it. For example, uh, Amazon or, um, you know, how Amazon does, you know, people who bought this product were also interested in or Netflix recommendations or if you're watching a YouTube video and the YouTube video ends and it goes to um, related YouTube videos or it'll start playing the next video f um, for people um, that you know, for recommendations. Um, all of that is all different information that these companies have on you that they're now able to recommend in, uh, more information, more content for you without you realizing it. And it's a lot more information than you're actually putting into the system. Um, so their idea is that they're able to, you know, track your behavior to such intricate levels and then data mine this information and actually translate it into actionable results. Um, you know, a lot of the big, you know, a lot of the big sites, Google, Facebook, you hear all the time how they're data mining you and they're collecting all this information on you, but they're not just collecting the information for the sake of having, you know, huge databases and they're not just collecting the information just for the sake of giving it to the NSA. They're actually trying to, um, obviously have action, some type of actionable results, some type of return on their investment. Some t and that could be in the form of an additional page view. If I saw a YouTube video and now they want to present and they're now, I want, you know, they saw me watch one video, they want me to see another video because that's going to double their advertising income, one versus two. So now they're going to take all that information they have on you and use it to show you a related video so that, you know, they get some type of ROI out of that. That's the end of my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? I actually had a question. I'm very intrigued of the new things that you are planning to do. If you can tell us more about what you are up to. Okay. So, so not even about the presentation. That's okay. So. So, um, as I was saying before, I started Danny Web. It's an online community of people who work in the IT industry. I started it while I was 
a uh, sophomore at Hofstra. I went into it full time when I graduated. I've been doing it for the past 15 years. And about a year and a half ago, I started um, a co-working space in Bayside called Danny Pant by Danny Webb. And it's a real life, I spent the past 15 years uh, having creating a virtual community of IT professionals. And now I created a real world community of um, technologists. And it's a shared office space, co-working space. We do meetups twice a month. Um, and it's located in Bayside. And then my third project that I just started a month or two ago um, is called Daza, D-A-Z-A-H dot com. And that is uh, a kind of uh, virtual matchmaking service for business networking. So the idea there is that, you know, over my 15 year career in digital marketing and advertising, I've attended so many industry networking events and you end up, you know, being courted into a room of a thousand people and end up having to go up to someone random and make small talk um, for the next 20 minutes before you find out exactly what it is that they do and find out that you don't really have anything in common with them and you can't really do business together. So then you kind of have to find a way to, you know, stop talking to them and move on to the next person and rinse and repeat. So I started um, Dazza to kind of, to kind of um, make that entire process a lot more efficient um, and virtualize it. Um, it's kind of a Tinder for business networking. <laughs> I have two questions which are related. One, do you see any seasonal statistics from EDU sites? I'm sort of imagining that you see peaks near midterms and finals. Um, yes, yeah, so we don't really see any um, increase in traffic of referral traffic coming from EDU sites, but definitely, definitely, definitely um, it's very seasonal in that we'll find in September, October, November, and whenever the, um, you know, whenever the spring uh, se uh, semester starts, we'll definitely um, get a huge influx of students um, posting questions on the site. So you can definitely, as, as a QA, and a you know, discussion forum, it's definitely seasonal in that respect. We also are very targeted towards um, people who, you know, the, the average age of our audience is mid-30s to 40s. So we have definitely on the weekends, traffic gets reduced in half because we have most people visiting the site from work. And the sort of related question is, do you have any way of determining the traffic to your site versus, let's say, Stack Overflow? Um, yes. So there are public tools such as Quantcast.com, um, Alexa, which I don't really like. There's Compete. There's Nielsen Net Ratings. So you know, if you've heard of Nielsen TV ratings, um, there's Nielsen Net Ratings that um, are for online, you know, for online metrics. Um, my favorite is Quantcast.com, and I like Quantcast specifically because a lot of the top sites put the um, tracking pixel on their site so that at very accurate um, demographic information and traffic information can be captured on them. Um, so it's relatively easy to actually be able to track accurately, um, you know, other sites in your niche. And the reason for that is because um, all of these publications all sell advertising space for a living. So what we want is we want these advertisers to have access to third-party demographic studies because you coming to me and me telling you, oh, we're, you know, 70% of our audience makes purchasing decisions and so on and so forth. So for, to be able to have, um, you know, independent demographic studies is, you know, is uh, very attractive to the prospective advertisers, and that's the incentive for us to all put these tracking pixels on our site. Can I ask one more? Yes. Um, do you track subject matter over time so that you can determine that something which was a hot topic or topic of interest has lost popularity or perhaps has become a done deal so no one needs to ask about it anymore? Right. So, um, you know, a lot of a lot of those type of things go into just structuring your database correctly because if you have a very, um, you know, depending on how your database is structured, you can then query that database in millions of ways and as time goes by, come up with new ways to query the database. So I might, you know, decide today, you know what, I want to find all female posters who were between the ages of 30 and 40 who asked a question about C++ and then 
received five or more responses. So there's just an unlimited number of ways that you can query that database. Um, you know, and, and you know, you're constantly trying to find new ways to take to query in different ways and then take that information and how could I translate that into actionable results. Um, so can you actually repeat your question? I lost track. It was uh, specifically the, the, the question was um, so, oh, if someone asked you know if topic, someone asked a question about a topic being able to track that topic. So we definitely do that, but then taking it a step farther in okay, yeah, maybe C++ isn't as popular. Now everyone is moving to Python or whatever the case may be. But um, then thinking it a step further, well, I'm actually not seeing um, a decrease among students in C++, but I am seeing a decrease in working professionals in C++. So there's just an unlimited number of different queries that you can actually perform. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so Danny, uh, thanks a lot for your talk. Uh, so we have here a number of students who are just starting as computer science. They're in CSE 15. We have Sam here who's ready to graduate next semester. Do you want to tell them anything? <laughs> <laughs> Do I want to tell them anything? Well, um, what, what are your interests? What? <laughs> gaming? Not gaming. Possibly gaming? <laughs> um, but yeah, um, like for me, I, um, I've been interested in math and science my entire life. I've been programming my entire life. Um, when I started at Hofstra, first of all, it was a no-brainer for me to do a computer science degree, but I wanted to be, um, I wanted to uh, basically be some type of, um, you know, a software engineer focusing on artificial intelligence and then... I ended up selling advertising space for a living. And so, um, you know, you never know um, where your life is going to end up. And, you know, for me, I was really able to, you know, combine what I'm doing now and bring that back to my degree. And, I, and as you hopefully saw from my presentation, you know, there's still statistics involved. Um, I started Web in 2002 when I was still a student here. And I remember taking statistics courses from the engineering department. And I was using Danny Web as a case study. Um, I, ha I have research papers um, still that were all about, you know, how I was analyzing the visitors and was able to, you know, extrapolate that X percentage were doing this and Y percentage were doing that. And if I change this, more percentage were doing this. And, you know, so it all can eventually come back, whether, you know, anything that you do in life, advertising, marketing can still come back to what you're learning here. Um, but yeah, if there's anything specific that um, you guys are interested in, like if you're interested in mobile dev or gaming or web dev or... Um, do you use any form of AI to optimize where you place ads or help make your website better in general? Um, not really. Um, I mean, it's, it's not really artificial intelligence that could be used to determine where you place ads because... Um, the IAB actually governs the size and placement of most ads on 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 publications across the web. Um, like, there's a leaderboard ad that's 728 pixels wide by 90 pixels high. But you know, we do um, a lot of data mining to <coughs> to actually. Um, track user behavior, see what the performance for a particular ad campaign is. I mean, obviously, if an advertiser purchases an ad campaign from us and then it doesn't perform very well, they're not going to renew. So our goal is to keep the performance as high as possible. So we're going to track that visitor behavior and see, well, what percentage of people are actually clicking on the ad? Well, is it they're on the wrong page? Do we? And, and that's all, um, you know, just basically pulling a lot of different reports and comparing and contrasting them and seeing what the similarities and differences are. And that goes back to the example that I gave um, of the, the real life example that happened even just this morning um, where the advertiser was targeting the exact same demographic with the exact same ad, um, you know, and with the exact same wording. And the performance is just incredibly different from being on one page of the site versus being on a different page of the site. Hi. Uh, so, since you're like uh, selling the advertising, advertising, advertising place for the, your uh, site, 
What do you think about the new trend that people using the ad blocks to block the ads from the site? And since a lot of sites are suffering from those. Ad blocking. Yeah, ad blocking. Mm -hmm. And because the Google like has the new plugins for the ad blocks, uh, like separately, so a lot of people has been using the ad blocks for the getting to like a Firefox and the, any of the browsers, and because of that, like the like a many different sites are trying to uh, block the contents, like unless they what is that? Uh, unless they turn up the ad block. Or so they're starting to, trying to utilize and get back the get back people from being clicking and getting gaining access to ads again. And what would be your response to those ad block services? Well, um, what a lot of people are actually surprised to learn is that as a publisher, publishers as a whole as a whole love ad blockers. Oh. Um, the reason for that is that we um, get paid. If let's say someone an advertiser were to come to me and say, okay, they want to purchase 500,000 eyeballs, basically purchase per ad view. So if they were to purchase 500,000 ad impressions, which is basically 500,000 eyeballs looking at their page, well, I would rather those 500,000 people... look at it. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, basically if you have an ad blocker, you're not going to be, you're not going to see an ad. So if, if an advertiser is coming to me and purchasing 500,000 ad views, I want those 500,000 people to be people who are actually like advertising and have, um, and have um, you know, inclination to actually click on ads and respond to them. Because if you don't like advertising, you're going to use ad blocker. Mm -hmm. And if you aren't using ad blocker, odds are you're going to ignore ads, you have banner blindness, you're not necessarily going to respond to ads the same way that people who are less, you know, or are more pro advertising who don't use ad blockers would. So as a publisher, um, for the most part, publishers as a whole, not just myself, actually like ad blocks because we want, um, you know, we want our advertisers to have the best return on their investment so that they'll advertise with us again. Oh. And so, <laughs> and so as a result, we want those, you know, if they're paying per ad view, we want to make those 500,000 people count by showing the ad, by using it by using those 500,000 impressions and not wasting them on people who most likely are not going to, you know, respond to the ad. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Did I answer your question? Yeah, no. Okay, good. <laughs> I may have purposely clicked on two ads in my entire life. What percentage of people actually click on an ad with the intent of doing something with it? <laughs> Um, so it's definitely a numbers game. Um, so if you were to go back to maybe the year 2000, the average click-through rate was 1%. Nowadays, the average click-through rate is probably 0.05%. Okay. Okay. I want to, on behalf of the Ava Lovelace Day Committee, thank you all for being here, and especially thank you for your I'm going to make the Lovelaces to indeed give people opportunities to see women in the sciences as models. Psychological studies show while men sometimes are inspired by seeing adventurous champions, women like to see that it's a job that women can do. And those of us who are women doing the job are the models for everyone around us. Thank you very much for coming, and we look forward to the next time we see you. And thank you.